today concerning your uncle, Melanie. Were you guys surprised at all? What did you think when you heard the news? Um, it was relieving, but we weren't surprised. We, we knew that it would be natural causes. We had no reason to think anything otherwise. Um, I think it was just a comfort, like finally, like this part is over and it's one more stepping stone to just keep revealing truth. And then, you know, the second half of the day, they open it up and say, well, it's still under investigation again. It just, it feels like every time we, we get a little bit of good news, there's a little bit of drag to that too, but overall just relief and, um, comfort to be in the right direction. You mentioned that they still said they're investigating and there's going to be people watching that still don't believe those results or say there's something yeah. more here. What do you say to them? I mean, you know, you see, you, you post truth out there and people have already made up their minds and decided. Um, yeah. Ian made a, a bad joke, like, well, did they test for all the invisible poisons? Like it's, it's, people will still think whatever speculation or rumors or whatever they want to believe, even when it's right in front of their face. And I was talking about this too. I was like, you know, when Tylee and JJ show up, you know, again, and are and you're here again, I don't know if people would even believe it. They still, you know, go on with their own, um, you know, it's still a cold. It's still, they've done something bad. And it's it, a lot of people already made up their minds and we just want to, come on and share what we do know and share truth and hopefully we, you know, keep getting opportunities where, where people will be open to that and be able to listen. So Melanie, Alex was your uncle and, uh, you know, from the beginning, a lot of people have thrown questions out there as to why he died. Was this big a coincidence? Was this just a big coincidence? Did you from the beginning think it was, or did in the back of your mind, did you think there might be something more here? There was absolute shock. Um, when I got a phone call from Zulema and she was telling me, um, I had spoken with Alex earlier that day and he it seemed okay, but I knew that week before he was having trouble with, um, he was overall a pretty healthy guy, but stubborn, like wouldn't ever, you know, put a bandaid on if he's bleeding everywhere and, you know, wouldn't do regular checkups. He just was a tough guy. And uh, when he told me we were going to, meet up at one point, I was going to bring him some of his stuff because he had moved down to be with Sloma. And he then said, hey, you know, let's not meet up halfway. Let's wait. I'm not feeling very good. And that was big for him to say that because he never would um, say that he wasn't feeling good. So the week before, he said, you know, I just kind of have tightness in my chest or having trouble breathing. He said he had bent down to get a water bottle and took the breath out of him. And, you know, I... Zulema was absolutely worried and was like, you need to get to the doctor. And he was like, no, 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 I'm fine. And the morning of, um, it was really kind of, I, I called him probably every other day um, once he wasn't in Arizona anymore, or in, sorry, in Idaho. And the morning um, I called him, Ian was at work. And he was somebody I could kind of just, you could tell him anything, he's like a vault. And I was just openly telling him about, you know, things in my new marriage, things that were, you know, challenging or things that were going really well. And he was just my best friend at that point. And he shared some things with me that were, um, I just felt like, write them down when he started talking to me. I don't know why I felt impressed to do that, but like he, what? Just said, you know, he said, Melanie, the most important thing in your marriage is to be loving, be supportive and be patient. And he kept repeating that. And I was like, and I need to, I need to remember that always, like it always comes back to that. And, you know, it was his last words to me and I didn't know that, but it was really just special. Like that I felt, you know, like, Hey, write that down. And he just said, you know, everything's going to be fine. And, um, you know, just keep moving forward in faith. You're going to have your kids back soon and everything's going to work out and just, you know, just go on faith. And I, Later that evening, I get a call from Zulema, and I think I was excited. I started telling her about my day, or um, and then it just shifted, and I, Ian was there, and I kind of just went into a shock for a little bit, and I fell to the floor, and I just felt all the feelings of losing, losing such a close friend, and I hadn't been very close with Alex um, most of my life. I was closer with um, my aunt and even my other uncle, but after starting to have challenges in my 
in my last marriage, Alex was a truck driver and you could just call him, he always answered. And uh, he would just talk and let you talk to him. And I, I do talk a lot. And he would let me just vent and he would say, he never would put somebody down or judge them. He would just say, well, here's how you handle that situation. And um, like nobody could do any wrong in his eyes. He just, he just uh, was very positive and somebody that was so influential to be around when I'm going through the hardest thing and missing my, my four children. Uh, he just picked me up every day. How's Zulema doing? Um, I love Zulema with all my heart. I feel like it's been really hard. She hasn't been able to really mourn and grieve the loss of her husband and, um, you know, all the accusations going out there. She doesn't really feel um, ready to come forward and share that story. And I respect that um, or, or share her feelings on everything. And she's still just trying to get through every day and missing her husband. Um, but, but she's doing okay. I want to kind of back up to to hear a little bit about each of you guys because there there has been some li limited information that's come out about each of you. But would you mind just telling me about yourself, how you guys met, how you ended up in Idaho, and then back in Arizona? Mm -hmm. Ian, could you start? Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, I grew up in Southern California, um, and I moved to I got married in 2010, moved to Idaho in 2011. Uh, with my ex-wife Natalie, we had two kids together. Um, so right now they're nine and they're seven, Max and Lily. Um, miss the, and you know they're fantastic kids. They, you know, I, I, I miss them a lot right now, and you know, I, I would love to get them down here to Arizona. But um, so yeah, we were there with our kids. I started school um, at BYU Idaho. I never finished. Um, just work, school, and, and being a dad was too much, and I just figured I'd work. So um, Natalie and I hit, you know, hit our ninth anniversary, and on our ninth anniversary, she asked for a divorce, um, and so we, you know, we worked our way through that. Uh, got, you know, our, that started in March of 2019. Um, and, you know, got all wrapped up in July, and then, um, yeah, I, I, I decided I, you know, try to jump back into dating a little bit. Talk to uh, you know, I was talking to my friends and and you know, you know my my family and just kind of saying like you know I want to get back out and meet people. I, it wasn't really my goal to get to find you know a wife. I just wanted to find people to hang out with and you know at the same time I I just gone through a really rough divorce. It kind of tore me up and I'm trying to put my life back together and you know maybe looking for a little bit of validation, just somebody to talk to who's not going to judge me and, and you know push me away. So you know I. I um, I downloaded some dating apps and found Melanie on one of them and asked her on a date that day. I figured, you know, I hate talking to people through text. I don't, I don't feel like I communicate well through over text or, you know, it, it, you know, I can't, I'm sarcastic a lot. And so you know, that doesn't, that doesn't come across well in text sometimes. So I just wanted to, I feel better meeting people in person. So invited her out to dinner. We um, went to McKinney River. River. Sorry, what, what month was this Ian? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So this was November. No, so we, no, Melanie, you had moved to Rexburg. Yeah, the first week in November, I moved to Rexburg. So, so you both were already both in the same town together. Right. We were across the street from each other. Yeah, we actually found uh, that out. And you didn't know that? We didn't even know, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So you went to McKenzie River? Yeah, she, 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 was, she was just, I don't know how to describe it other than she just, every, everything just kind of clicked with her. Um, we'd had so many, so many similar experiences with the way our divorces went. The way the last year of our lives went, you know, had gone with with uh, with just the struggles, and and uh, we understood each other. Um, you know, I, I found I found no judgment with her, no um, no preconceived notions. She just wanted to get to know me, and you know, we we spent the next you know two days basically just talking constantly. It was. You know, I guess I guess with the the, la the, the previous people I, I dated, it felt like I was trying to make up reasons to continue to date those people. You know, to go on a second date or whatever. But with her, it was just easy. It clicked, and I didn't have to try to do mental gymnastics to justify a second date. And then you got married shortly thereafter, right? Correct. So, um, so yeah, one one of the things that I really loved, um, you know, one of the things that I guess got me that led to us getting married so quickly was our children. Um, I learned that, you know, she had four kids. 
And I, I, you know, I absolutely love that. She, you know, she said she saw my dating profile that I'm, you know, one of the first things I put in, in, in my, my bio, I guess, is that I'm a dad. You know, I've got two kids. I love them with all my heart. Um, you know, and I, and I, I want them to be a big part of our lives. And, and uh, you know, I, I didn't want to have, I didn't want to, I didn't want anybody to be a part of my life that wasn't going to be supportive of my role as a father to my two, ch two children. And it's the same with her. Um, I still haven't had the opportunity to meet her kids yet. And I would, I would, I can't wait, but, uh, seeing her interact with my kids for the first time, you know, we, we came, so we came to Arizona. Um, I came down with my two children to have Thanksgiving with my family. And, uh, she came down, um, a few days later and on her way down, she was talking about how she didn't have anybody to go to Thanksgiving with And So I invited her to come be with my family. It was kind of a spur of the moment thing. And uh, so she showed up and my kids immediately fell in love with her. They, um, you know, my daughter, she, she can be a little shy, a little standoffish and just immediately was, was attached to Melanie. Wanted, wanted to just take her around and show her everything she'd been doing, play games with her, tell her everything that's on her mind. My daughter doesn't, she has no filter, so she'll just say exactly what she's thinking. <laughs> um, and just to see Melanie interact with my kids, um, it just made me fall really hard, really fast for her because she's just so sweet and good with them. At one point I had gotten out of the car to go run into the gas station on our road trip and Lily said to Ian, don't blow it, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think you would. You guys were married shortly thereafter, right? After Thanksgiving? Right, yeah, November 30th. November 30th. We were, it was really fast and, um, you know, I was in this, you know, battle still with my ex and didn't have my kids with us right then but we felt um both ready we, we pray about decisions together and we felt you know that it was right that we should get married when we did and you know vegas wedding wasn't dreamy or anything but our goal was to be sealed in the temple you know, one day and so we said let's do this while we have max and lily and then when we have raxton brighton blake and breeze too let's all be together when we have that special day where we can be sealed together now were alex and zulema married did you guys have a joint wedding or was that separate? So Alex and Zulema had been dating for several months and kind of, Alex was very ready to marry Zulema and she was a little bit like, you know, I'm going to wait till I get an answer. I know I'm supposed to be with you, Alex, but I'm going to wait until it feels like the right time. And they um, had talked about, do you want to get married in Jackson or, um, you know, Las Vegas? And it just so happened when they were, they picked their date and had it more planned than Ian and I did. And, you know, the, coincidence of it of it right after them wasn't planned or anything it was just what what happened and they they were there and we had made the decision in Arizona during Thanksgiving and we said let's do it and while we're there you know we need a witness and Alex and Zulema are there and you know this isn't our big wedding day this is just the beginning of our lives together and we'll have that special moment when we're all together as a family. Okay so they got married the day before you guys did? Yes I believe so. So, one so day we got married on, I think they got married on the 29th. Yeah. And was it uh, just an intimate ceremony for the both of you, like any extended family or, you know, friends, or was it just kind of a small group? Yeah, it was just in, for Ian and I, we had two or three hours. We got a, a dress and a, a tux and got the kids all dressed up. It was a small, um, I think the lucky little wedding chapel, I think is where we, um, where we picked and it's a small room. Um, and it was just very intimate, um, quick, not um, anything crazy or anything, but it was special to us. And then Alex and Zulema just were there as our witnesses. And um, it was just planned last second. We didn't have time to invite a lot of people. It was just a, on a whim decision. It felt like it's what we should do. Now, Melanie, were you born and raised in Arizona? I wasn't. So I was born in Utah, but um, lived in Phoenix as a baby and then lived in California for a while. And then Seattle is where I spent a lot of time growing up. Um, and your mom unfortunately passed away when you were young, right? Yeah. So we, um, my mom got really sick a couple years after having me. She almost died having me. She had a, um, a deep vein thrombosis, blood clot. Um, and our, the Cox side doesn't really have, we, there's a lot of, um, my grandpa's had cancer and blood clots and um, initially when we heard about um, I believe uh, my grandfather was told by the police that um, 
Alex, they had thought that he had a, a lung clot um, was the reason for his death initially. So that's what we thought this whole time um, that, you know, it kind of runs in the family and that makes sense. But, um, but yeah, my, I think my parents had a, a rough time when my mom got really sick with type one diabetes. Uh, also with gastroparesis, she couldn't have the ability to absorb nutrients and she was in and out of seeing doctors and in and out of hospitals. And I think it was hard on my dad. I know there was um, some infidelity on his part and they tried to work through things and they just couldn't make it work. And I spent a lot of time in the Cox home. So Barry and Janice, my grandparents, they lived in California and I lived with them for a while and uh, my mom was sick. And I remember my dad traveling a lot um, for, for his job and um, my mom finally felt like she was healthy enough when we moved to Seattle where my dad got a job there and it was just me my mom and my dad my mom couldn't have any more kids and um, I was kind of there there be and uh, when I was six uh, my dad just I remember that's about as far back as I can remember is the night my dad took me and he said we were going to go get gas and we never came back. We left my mom there and he turned the power off. He took all of her credit cards, he took her planner and just left her there. And she was really sick to the point she couldn't really take care of herself. And we hid out in a hotel for a couple months and started a nasty custody battle um, between them. And, you know, as when you're little, I just remember just being quiet, not really understanding what was going on. And um, I don't remember what went on in the court process. I just remember not seeing my mom a lot. And she was, she fought as much as she could. And I think she got so sick, ran out of money and things just weren't, you know, just in her case. And it, um, I grew up with just, you know, my, my dad and then later my stepmom when my dad got remarried. And I heard all manner of things about the Coxes and I, my dad kind of cut off communication with them. Um, and these were people I grew up with and I knew they were good people and I loved them. And it didn't feel right a lot of the lies I was being told about them. But um, my mom later passed away when I was nine. Lori was the one that called and told me the news. She said, your mom's in a coma and she's, you know, she's probably not going to make it. And I remember that phone call. And I've always loved and trusted Lori. She's always been somebody that is just so much unconditional love on it, no drama, and I admire her so much. And I don't think I would have wanted to have that phone call by anybody else to have to give me that news. And I remember flying up with my dad. He took me to see my mom last time in hospice. Um, she was she was out, and she didn't come out of her diabetic coma. There was no, um, you know, it wasn't a surprise. My mom was always very sick and on the line of, you know, we don't know how long Stacy's going to last. And after nine, my age nine and my mom passed, my dad didn't let me talk or see any of that side of the family. And I didn't know why other than he was saying um, all sorts of things about them. And finally, when I was 15, I found my uncle Adam on a radio. Um, I, I think I Googled him, we had computers at high school and I found him and he was one of my favorite, favorite people in my life that I remember growing up. And, and then it, kind of started connecting all those ties that I had gone so, so long from age nine all the way to 15 without. And it's like we jumped right back into it. And uh, for all those years, they didn't have me and they, they tried sending packages and my dad would return them. And I never understood, I just felt something off in my heart, but I, um, no judgment or resentment on, you know, why my dad did the things he did. But I just, I wish to this day he would, you know, just, say it for what it is, just be real about it, because that's how we, that's how we grow, we go through these experiences, and um, E and I are, that's the most important thing to us, like, we're not perfect, I'm terrible about being nervous on, you know, national time, I'm trying to get better at it, and it's hard to see all the comments people say about you, but we're just trying, we're trying to just be real and be open about everything now. So was it kind of like Lori raised you after your mom passed? Mainly my grandma Janice. Lori was young um, and kind of, you know, busy with her life, but she'd take me and go do fun things. And also my my, uh, my aunt Summer and um, my uncle Adam was, and I wasn't super close with Alex. He, um, 
I didn't ever get his jokes. He's a comedian, and I just was always like, I don't, I, it probably takes me a minute to process, like longer than most people, and so I would never really like connect as much with Alex as I did with Adam or or Lori. But um, but yeah, they were so important in my life, and to not have that growing up and have that confusion of you know what happened and why did things go south? And up until three years ago. I didn't know that my dad had been telling everybody this other side of, hey, your mom died of anorexia and, you know, she's mentally ill and, you know, basically made himself look like the hero. I took you away from her and I knew that didn't feel right. And I was like, kind of in shock that, that everybody in the whole world thinks that she dies of anore- died of anorexia and she's not here to tell her story. And I have all of her medical records and all the court documents. And I just, it's hard seeing the same patterns of what happened to my mom now happen in my life where my kids are taken away from me wrongfully. Things are said about me that are true, but I know my kids know who I am. And my own, my own father is helping my ex-husband right now. And, and they've had my kids at their house and don't tell me. And I just have bullying text messages from my, from my dad. And that's upsetting. I feel like should love your kid no matter what if all these false claims if they were even true if they really thought I was some crazy and in a cult and done something horrible shouldn't they just reclaim me with kindness as their as their daughter and love me anyways but the fact that these things aren't true it's it's absolutely heartbreaking and I don't have you know a good relationship right now where I feel like I can keep them keep them close in my life right now I'm kind of just loving them from a distance and letting everything play out and I don't judge anyone for all the things that they're scared of or confused about because this case is is heavy and it's unlike anything I never thought this would be our lives like it's it's unreal I I do want to ask you um there have been other reports about your mother's death that somehow Lori may have been tied into it or, or whatever's killing all these other people your mom may have been the first victim can you address that? Yeah, she died of natural causes. It's on her death certificate. But um, she she had type 1 diabetes and with gastroparesis with that, like she she went to every type of doctor. She even went and, you know, went to, you know, I think she got tested for eating disorders for, for everything she got tested for. Or what she had, it was so far from anorexia. It was a total manipulation of, you know, she's tiny and can't absorb nutrients, and they, he took us and ran with the story of that, and it's hurtful, and it's untrue, and she's not here to tell that truth, and, you know, reading through court documents, there are so many things he could have said, because we're real and open about our family, and we make mistakes, he could have said, you know, true thing, it was mostly just lies about everything, and that's similar to what's happening in my family court case, it's the same pattern, and I think I think we go through these things to to learn and experience and seeing that same exact thing happen now in my life it's too it's too ironic that it's the same exact patterns Tylee when's the last time you guys saw them so Ian's never met Tylee you've never, you never seen them okay what about you Melanie so the last time I saw them was um, they were packing up um, their home in Chandler where Charles had been shot and um, I remember how emotional it was just it's hard to be there this is where this big thing happened and Tylee was like I don't it's hard being here in this house after that that um, situation happened and um, Lori had you know said hey you know I think she thrown out Ida Biden and sometimes she's had to do things to protect her kids the court systems haven't protected her and Tylee and Colby were, were abused by their dad, Joe, and the court system didn't protect them there. And she's had this history of doing everything she can to protect Tylee and JJ. And um, I've always seen that in her since, since I was um, a teenager and she flew me out to go nanny for Tylee and JJ. Like, I've never seen any evidence or anything at all that tells me that Lori would purposely harm children or anything. And so it's hard, all the attacks being out there and seeing her 
I still see her as the um, wonderful mom she is. When I see her come in court, I'm looking for you know, something off that I'm not seeing because I've had every fear of where could they be. But the last time I saw them was the end of August as they were moving because I think they moved up that first week in September. And, 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 um, and hey, did you visit Rexburg at all before? Like, did you come up and visit Lori before you moved here? I did in, I think on a weekend um, where I didn't, because we have 50-50 custody, um, uh, my ex friend Drew and I, and so anytime I didn't have, uh, wasn't my time with the kids, I was a wreck and just missed my kids, and so um, I tried to go hike in Arizona or go on a trip, and um, I did go visit Lori for a weekend up there, and she just, just come, you know, get a try out somewhere new travel and come see if you like it up here and um we toured byu idaho and um she said uh, tylee was um, with friends and she always is with friends so i didn't ask any questions about that and um jj is either doing some some type of therapy or with a nanny or in a school that will help him and so if i didn't see him i wasn't like asking you know where is he i just i've always trusted her and I had known that they left to Idaho because they were being threatened by people. And I didn't want to ask so many questions and I didn't know what to do with that. And I just was like, there for love and support. What can I do for you? And um, you don't have to tell me. I just want to be there to help you guys. And so then you moved up later in November. You, you didn't see the kids at all. And did you think that was a little suspicious, a little weird? I mean, I could understand maybe one day not seeing them or two days, but after days and days go by, you don't see the kids. Tylee's Jeep isn't there. Did you did you ever ask Lori, hey, where are Tylee and JJ? Um, I moved up that first week in November. Alex helped me move on uh, Halloween night. And uh, we drove up that first week in November with a moving truck and um, I was very involved in setting up my home, getting everything for my kids. I did bring all of the things they do need with them besides, you know, a mattress that had stains on it and some broken toys and outgrown clothes that I left out front. Not all of it, um, that uh, was important to us and to kind of consolidate into a smaller apartment as well. And um, I was getting my home ready and like, I'm going to figure out what's going on with the kids and get all my get my kids back here. We're going to have a fresh start. And um, Lori is very independent. She's doing her own thing. And she was next door, but I, I spent most of my time with Alex. Alex was, um, he'd come over and hang out with me if I was having, most days were, were hard and teary with missing my kids. And he would kind of come over and lift me up. And so if I saw Lori, she was, you know, she was, you know, still moving in in that process and getting situated there. And so I didn't spend a lot of time over there. I did see um, some of their things. Um, and she had a room set up perfectly for Tylee and JJ. And um, it didn't seem strange to me. And I knew the threats that she was getting from Kay Woodcock and from others. And um, she, I, I guess I didn't ask questions because I knew that history. I knew what was going on. And I was in my own head. I'm trying to find out where my own kids are. You know, there's going to be people that say, you know, when we get together with relatives, the talk instantly turns to our kids, soccer games, whatever, that, you know, you can't, there's not a lot else to talk about, you know, other than family. So when you actually would see her, did that sort of conversation ever come up of, you know, I could maybe understand a day or two, but if you're going on weeks and haven't seen him like, oh, hey, where, where's JJ been, especially because he has special needs. Right. Yeah. And so she would tell me things like um, one of the neighbor boys next door, I forget his name, but she would tell me all his friends and how funny they were. And some people were a little bit, um, JJ, JJ was very high energy and sometimes he'd be in other people's space. And I think sometimes that, that bothered some other people. So she would say, well, these are, these are the friends that are just, you know, not judgmental and they'll just let JJ come in. And, um, and she said that he loved the school there. We did. She she always talks about her children, but um, just during that time, I guess, to I guess the twentieth is about when Ian and I started dating. Um, I, I didn't I didn't see them, but I didn't see a, a lot of Lori. I saw Alex pretty much every day, and anytime I I guess would 
um, go over like, well, it's Tyler, you know, she's out with, she's out with friends and, um, you know, we're doing everything we can to protect the kids from cake is causing a lot of trouble right now. And I didn't really get into too much of what their own custody deal with that was, but, um, yeah, I, to be honest, I'm in my own head and don't know where my own kids are at this point. And as we know, later in November is when I went up to, or went down to Utah to try to see, you know, what we could work out and where they were at. And then you guys got married and ended November. Then did you move into Ian's place? Uh, no, so we kind of kept both of our apartments and um, I had a, a lease on mine and he did also. And so we kind of, we would sleep at my apartment and um, set up stuff for Max and Lily over at, at mine. And I had one extra bedroom and her, yeah, one extra bedroom. And so we spent most time at my apartment. When did you guys find out that there was an investigation that JJ and Tylee were missing? So I'm foggy on this date, but Tyler Masio and another gentleman had come by to my door while I was moving my stuff in. So this had to have been early in November, I think, probably the second, I guess the second week in November. And I get a knock at the door and I open it and see police and I'm like, you know, jumpy because you know, what is my ex, <laughs> what's my ex up to? What's the next thing is, or my, I don't know where my kids are, are my kids okay? And he just asked, he said, hey, you know, or um, is, do you know who lives next door? And I said, yeah, it's, um, I think Alex's name was on the lease. So sometimes my uncle's over there. Sometimes my aunt goes over there and just, you know, openly. And I didn't know what that was about. And that was it. That was um, just um, my first encounter with Rexford police, I guess. And that's and when then, they said that the kids are missing. No, not yet. This is um, early November. So November, whenever we, right before Thanksgiving, we're driving down to Arizona. Ian was already there and I was, I was driving down to meet his family and have Thanksgiving with his family. And I get a text from Lieutenant Ball that says, somebody's broken into your home. Um, I need you to call me right away. And I'm immediately like, oh, great. My ex has sent somebody. He, I knew he had a private investigator following me. And I immediately think, like, he sent somebody to come break into my home. That was my first thought. To text back, I was kind of processing. And then later, at a, um, later, I texted back. And I said, I said, well, I'm with, you know, um, people I love on Thanksgiving. And at least, at least that's what's important. If whatever the heck was taken, I had, a, um, you know, my emergency cash savings and I had you know just computer a computer an iPad um an old phone I didn't use like I didn't know what had been taken but I was like if any if they, my whole apartment is robbed it's okay I'm you know I got everything I need it's not about things and uh then he said you know I need you to call me and and then later found out that it was the Rexford police they had knocked down my door and they had taken all my a lot of my things and I uh I was kind of, I kind of felt bothered that that was the text I got, but I understand they're just doing investment. Um, as soon as I returned after Thanksgiving, um, I uh, um, went right into Detective Aramisio and I was just like, you know, what's going on? And I'm here to get my stuff. And he asked me about, you know, my marriage previously with Brandon and kind of, you know, what I'm doing here and asked me about Lori and Alex. And I just kind of an open book. Here's, what I know, and Lori and Chad had left um, probably right around when I was going down to Arizona. Um, they packed up and left. And um, I think it was a planned move. It wasn't a last minute spur because they had talked about, the, hey, we're going to um, move to Hawaii at some point because we talked about, um, they told Ian when they met Ian, you know, you have to come visit us in Hawaii sometimes. Can you see so, how that looks suspicious, though? The timing of them. How it looks suspicious. Right in the middle of all of oh, them. Absolutely, everything looks suspicious. That, but it's I knew that they had planned to move then, and I didn't know exactly when they were going to move. And, um, yeah, so many things don't look suspicious, of course. And um, I think having some basis of knowledge on, you know, what people had already planned and what's actually going on, it kind of makes it less suspicious to me, I guess. Where do you guys think JJ and Tylee are? I don't know. And I've been asked that so many times. And as we know, I've had every fear in the world of where, what could have happened to them. And I think most of December when 
after Lori and Chad just disappeared and I didn't have a phone number for them and no contact, I am thinking the worst because I'm hearing, I get a, a phone call from one of Lori's old friends and she scares me with a lot of, well, I think this happened or this could have happened. And I'm having every what if, because I'm like, yeah, I didn't see them the whole time I was up there in November, but I also know, and it's seen, you know, text messages from, from Kay and how she was treating Lori after um, Charles passed away. And I also knew who Lori was though. And Lori's always been somebody with a plan. She's always um, done everything to protect her kids. So up until when my door was broken down and things shifted and I can't talk to Lori and Chad, absolutely. I'm dumping on Ian, hey, what if this happened? What if this happened? And if I have a nightmare about something happening, like what if this? And it just got dumped all on him unfairly as we're, we're newly married and this just gets thrown in our lap. We can transition with that into everything mm -hmm. that you allegedly told him or that, that Ian wrote down. So Ian, can you, can you just kind of explain the background about how this document came to be? So the, the whole it was to send to Melody's lawyers so that they knew what I had gone in and told the FBI. So I told Melanie it was December 19th, I think, that I'd been talking with the police. And a little later, I told her I'd been recording her. Um, and when I wrote that document, the whole purpose was, yeah, it was, it, so after the, it was after I told Melanie I'd been working with the FBI and the police that I wrote this. The whole idea is to protect her. Her lawyers need to know exactly what I said, how I said it. Um, and that's how I wanted to present it to them is these are, these, these are the fears that I shared with them that Melanie had shared with me, you know, and, and in that document, I mean, it's, it sounds a lot more affirmative than what I heard, but when I go into the police, I want action. You know, I want, I want, you know, I want this to be over with basically. So my whole purpose is, you know, I, I, I went and I shared with the FBI, everything that I heard, everything, you know, I think, you know, at, at that point, I thought the kids were in danger. I thought there was something, you know, dark and sinister going on. I was afraid. Um, and so things came out when I talked with the FBI in a way that they shouldn't have. And I kind of regret the way I presented it to them because I feel like it's kind of blown this thing up a lot more than it should have. Um, you know, there wasn't really a whole lot going on until my ex-wife and I went in and spoke with the FBI and the police. Um, and then, you know, a week later, they're starting to put out press releases and, and all these things. So, you know, I don't know if, 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 that, if, if what we shared acted as a catalyst for that or, if, you know, maybe I'm just full of myself. Well, but for the casual reader seeing this, uh, there there is some shocking stuff in there. I mean, yeah, you know, Chad and Lori apparently told you, Melanie, that JJ and Tylee had been possessed and become zombies, uh, that Alex may have to take care of the kids. Great faith never wavered in his trust of the Lord. Ian, can you understand that these writings are alarming, you know, concerning, suspicious on all counts? Yeah, you yeah, know, I, I, I can absolutely see you know, yeah, anybody who doesn't know what's going on, they're going to look at this and go, yeah, this is insane. And at the time I wrote this, this is something where um, Brandon uh, and my ex-wife, Natalie, so Brandon contacted my ex-wife, Natalie, basically shared the idea with her that Melanie's in a cult, Lori's in a cult, Chad's a cult leader. They tried to kill me. They killed Charles. There was this whole plot. And I'm hearing this and I'm going, holy crap, what did I get myself into? Um and so anything that happens, anything I hear from then on, even if it's something I've heard before, I'm looking at it through the lens of this could be a cult. Something weird is going on. And I'm hearing this right after her door gets kicked in by the Rexburg police and we see a search warrant looking for JJ. And so everything seems really off at that point. And so, you know, I, I've kind of described it in the past as, you know, like you see a Treehouse of Horrors episode of The Simpsons for Halloween and you see a dark, you know, a claw, you know, shadow of a claw up on the wall, and then the light comes on. You see it's just a branch scratching on your window. You know, there's, there, I guess, depending on how you shine the light, there's, there are, there's, there are facts. But then, depending on how you shine the flashlight on, the facts look different. And so, the way I'm looking at it when I'm hearing all these things is I'm scared. This, you know, there's, there's a cult, there's you know, all this going on. And as I looked at it, as I, you know, as you go through the document, you kind of see my thought process of, you know, this is stuff that I'm hearing. This is stuff I'm worried about. And as I continue to look at it, I'm starting to see that there's really nothing proving any of this. There's nothing proving that 
Tylee and JJ have come to any harm, aside from the fact that, you know, I mean, you can even see at the end of the document, I'm still questioning, why in the world do we not know where the kids are? Um, but as I've, you know, gotten to know um, Summer and Janice um, and heard more about Lori's life and the experiences she's gone through, I'm starting to see, you know, maybe there is some reasoning behind what's going on. I, I have no clue what's going on, but I know that, you know, Melanie is a good person. I've loved her through this whole thing, you know, and I was never really concerned about her, but in the beginning, I'm like, holy crap, her uncles are into some shady stuff. I need to try to figure out what's going on. I'm going to get, I'm going to wear, you know, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to record their conversations, try to get from point A to point B, get this thing wrapped up and over with so I can move on with my life and my new life. So Thank Melanie, you. oh, go ahead, Melanie. I was going to say, I think it's important to understand where some of these things come from. So initially when Charles filed for divorce with Lori, he brought a document over to my home um, with me and Brandon and we were still, you know, we were still married and everything seemed okay right then. And Charles and Lori, things just went quick. She had found a lot of um, women on his computer and a lot of purchases and stuff that he did, you know, purchasing through, I think it was Hollywood Hobbies or something, I can't remember. And she's upset, obviously, and he's, somebody that's on the road all the time for his career, similar to what Brandon does for his, for his work. And she found this and, you know, kind of confronted him with it, you know, what is this? And Charles had never said an ill thing about Lori ever, just thought the world of her, just worshiped her. And uh, as soon as she just started asking questions, he just, he flipped. He came over to our house. He said, you know, Lori's, Lori's crazy. Uh, he showed us this document. And that's the first time I saw these stats, if you will, of, it was from Charles and he said, I found this um, and it said, it's, it's been posted all over, right? And it's, you know, so something about Lori or uh, um, Tylee, Tylee being dark and JJ being light. And I'm like, you know, trying to process all of this, you know, what does this mean? And he came over saying, hey, uh, Lori doesn't think I'm me. She thinks I'm Ned or something. And I'm, you know, what do you take from all that? I don't, I don't understand what's going on. It just fell off. I'm like, what's, what's going on here? And, you know, Lori wasn't telling everybody in our family, hey, Charles has been cheating on me. She was keeping it to herself, dealing it, dealing with it, trying to keep it between just her and Charles. And Charles just went ballistic and he started emailing everybody in the family. And then he took JJ away and he's like, Lori, you're never going to see JJ again. You're crazy. And, and it's these pattern, patterns of narcissism where, you know, everything's fine until you start asking questions. I mean, it, I didn't see the same exact pattern happen with my ex-husband. Everything was fine. He thought the world of me until I asked some questions he was uncomfortable answering. And instead of saying, hey, you know, these things, here's, here's an explanation for this. Um, he turned on me and he said, not only am I take the kids away from you, you're crazy. I'm going to get you excommunicated from the church and you're never going to see your kids again. And that's just from asking, hey, what are, what's this video I found, right? What are these text messages and uh, so many things. And I don't know, it was like watching Charles unravel first, then Brandon did the same exact thing. And then it's just these patterns. And I'm like, you just can't like make this stuff up. It's the same exact thing happening over and over again. And, um, you know, Lori just moved on and, you know, she didn't play any of Charles's games and he, uh, Eventually, he's back and forth. Hey, I want to be back together with you, Lori. And then he'd say, you know, your, you know, your end's coming soon. Just tons of threats. And so the day he came to the house, um, Summer said, hey, you know, Alex, will you girls has been kind of aggressive and, you know, acting crazy. He's going to go over there to get JJ. Will you uh, just go over there just in case something happens? And as we see, something did happen. And I know they're trying to change that whole investigation now to make it look like uh, Lori had something planned or Alex did, but there's no doubt in my mind about that shooting. Um, Brandon, Brandon went and ran with that story to his advantage. He pulled me into the garage. Um, it's uh, he and my uncle Adam said, you know, Charles has been murdered by Alex. And you know, just finding this out, I'm like, it doesn't feel right, but I'm like, there's... So you do believe that Charles was shot in self-defense, that Alex was defending himself. Absolutely. And I think um, Tylee was the biggest, I don't know, I went to her and I was just like, how are you? Um, and she, she was so brave 
about speaking about it and I was like wow like and Tylee's very collected very mature I admire Tylee so much for how brave she was and she explained everything as so did Lori and so did Alex and it made sense with how Charles had been acting and you know you're in shock that that it just went to that extreme but I'm glad Alex was there to protect Tylee because that's the only you know Lori and Charles were arguing but the only time Alex said, hey, I want to get, I'm going to get involved in this is when, you know, he had a baseball bat and was, you know, I don't know, I, with, with Tylee, he was, I don't know if he was going to hit her, it sound, Tylee made it sound like he was, they were, he, he was probably going to hit her and kind of taking the bat away, and I hated that Tylee had to go through that, and um, I know there's been a lot of criticism of how Lori acted afterwards, and, you know, how she's smiling on camera, and I know Lori, and she, when she's uncomfortable, she kind of, yeah, we're in shock. She'll just kind of laugh or, or smile, try to make light of it. And I, I do the same thing. That's just a something, how we handle being in shock. And every person handles being in shock differently. But that's when everything was kind of started to be uh, strange. Charles had uh, said all these things in court documents, things I had never heard Lori say. And that's when he started, um, that's when it kind of all these you know, these strange ideas started get started flowing around. And our family, and I know Lori, um, Lori's always been an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She loves learning, and she spent a lot of time and learn and grow from experiences and try to feel peace from all the things that have happened in her life. And um, Charles, I feel like, took that to an extreme um, with the things that he said about her. Honestly, I I see everything that Charles did, and it looks as if he was setting up. As soon as Lori caught on to what he had done, he it was, like the emails about his life insurance. Charles sold life insurance and had his own company. I mean, the, the texts between people, it almost looked like a setup. It was very alarming to see all these things. Um, and, um, you know, I, I've been asked, well, you know, what spiritual experiences has Lori had has Lori had and that's not for me to answer or to say what Lori and Chad's beliefs are but I know what I know the people they are and I know they're good people and they're they're trying and you know there's somebody that some people as a family would get together and talk about you know the mysteries of God and the these deep doctrine conversations and hey what do you think about this what about this idea or hey this isn't a book what do you think about this we're allowed to do that we're allowed to discern truth from error and just learn and in our church we believe in revelation where we can you know it's a it's an ongoing process and we're learning and continually everything's changing and we're just people that are trying to um grow in our faith and be closer to the savior and there's there's no cult if um i mean it's Lori's my aunt zulema's almost like an aunt to me alex is an uncle and this is this is my family and we're you know just trying to learn about these things, but the whole um, fear, I guess, where it comes down to Tylee and JJ and this zombie idea came from a disturbing phone call I got from one of Lori's old friends right after they took off to Hawaii and, um, it, you know, telling me these things, you know, Lori, you know, Lori and Alex, I think, did something to Tylee and JJ and we don't know where they're at and Lori's lied to you and all these things that didn't feel right. Um, that phone call, I just felt a lot of fear and doubt. And that's when I kind of went into this worrying phase of, and I, I'm, you know, I'm newly married to Ian and I'm sharing these things with him and can't sleep at night. So I'm nice. And I'm like, I don't know where they're at. I don't know what's going on. And I don't understand these things. Um, and Ian, which I don't know, is talking with uh, Natalie and Brandon and they're telling him these terrifying things that are true that I've, that I've plotted to kill Brandon and I'm in a cult. And so I have no idea <laughs> that what Ian's doing behind the scenes. And I'm, I'm in a scared time in my life where I'm trying to figure out the pieces. I'm trying to know what's going on with, with Brandon and his plans and who he's working with and where my kids are. And um, it's just a terror. December was terrifying. Like we're thrown into this boiling pot as soon as we get married and trying to just adapt the best we can. Melanie, did you actually believe these things that Lori and Chad had told you, or were you telling Ian just to kind of get it off your chest and say, I don't know what to think? Lori and Chad did not tell me 
most of those things in the document. Those were fears I was hearing from other people and never did I believe them, but I feared because I, you know, when you don't have knowledge about something, you think, and you're in a scary situation like this, you think the worst. And I am, I'm, I'm an open book. I just kind of say it how it is. And I learned like, you know, I didn't know Ian was, you know, recording conversations and all these things. But I didn't know Ian was talking to Natalie or to Brandon. And I had told Ian, you know, the history with Brandon. And um, I, I, I warned him, I said, you know, if, you know, Natalie's probably going to try to get a hold of Brandon and Brandon's going to run with all these, these lies about me. And Ian knew they um, knew who I was, but he, the factor of Tylee and AJ going missing and he's never seen them before and had only met Chad and Lori one time. He doesn't know, you know, what I know about the past of Lori trying to do everything she can to protect her kids and people who have been threatening her and, you know, being married so quickly, I don't think I had caught up, come up on all the family history and there was so much going on in our, in my own um, custody case with my children and we hadn't got to that. So real quick, we get married, thrown into this boiler pod and we're doing the best we can. And Ian, you know, I know he acted in on fears and doubt rather than the things that he did know, but I don't hold any blame towards him. This was a terrifying time for us. And I'm just continuously dumping on him. What, hey, you know, what if this happened? What if this happened if I, I had my, my dad sending me threatening messages saying things about the shooting and um, that Brandon Boudreaux's claiming. And I never even know, I still to this day don't know if this shooting actually happened or um, who who did this. Um, I, I you think it was Alex? I, the only time I thought it was Alex was, um, I think the first initial fear of could Alex have done, done something like this was, um, I don't know where the first fear came in, but the first meeting with Detective Pillar the day after the shooting, I, you know, I said, here's all the people Brandon associates with. If, and then he said, you know, do you have Alex in the morning? I said, yeah, here's our number. Do you think they have anything to do with it? But when I heard that, I kind of was like, okay, it sounds like Brandon's trying to set them up for something. And I know, I know they don't have anything to do with it. But later on in December, um, you know, Alex passes away. And then on Christmas, I get a phone call from Brandon and he says, you know, if you want to talk to your kids, um, you know, I had to listen to him bullying me for an hour and threatening me and saying, you have to go to the FBI and say that, you know, Alex shot at me. And I said, I don't know that Brandon. And he's like, if you ever want to see your kids again, you have to go and tell them that. And I was, you know, why, why, why did they never call Alex or say, Hey, can you come in and meet with us? We have some questions for you. Um, but he, Brandon was so sure, but his story kept changing to this day. I don't know what happened in this shooting. Um, he had my dad on board sending me text messages saying, Melanie, they're going to, sentencing is coming soon for you. They know it was Alex. They know it was, you know, this Jeep registered to Tylee. And like, I've been trying to put the pieces together of what's going on because I don't have the facts to that. But the, the knowledge that I do have, it's, it doesn't add up to all these, you know, speculation and rumors that are flying around. And still to this day, I have not seen one shred of evidence about this shooting Brandon's claiming that leads me to believe that it was Alex Cox. Do you uh, believe that Brandon has turned dark? No, that documented uh, the terminology. The way I understand this is in our faith, you have, you know, as you increase in um, becoming closer to your savior and act on obedience and, and righteousness, you increase in light. And um, as you, you know, make bad decisions or, um, you know, invite evil things into your life, um, you're, you know, you're, you're less, you're losing that light of Christ. Um, you know, there's no, I can't tell, um, you know, we talk about in our religion, the gift of spiritual discernment. Um, and I think you look at the fruits of people to, to know for yourself, hey, is this a good person? I want to be having my life. Is this a bad person? And never is there ever any ill intent if somebody is not making good choices in their life to do harm to them, pray for them and bless those who persecute you and use you. And that's how I view it. And I don't see um, children as being light or dark. We believe in um, at the age of eight um, is the age of accountability when you're baptized. And, you know, from then on, you can make decisions in um, light or dark, if you will. And that's just the terminology. I, I see these things are worded. It sounds, it sounds terrifying and they're, they're stemming from 
from bits of truth, I guess, that, you know, we talk about in this, um, in our religion, and um, that's kind of where that comes from. So in talking with you guys, you seem like mainstream Latter-day Saints. I think a lot of people would watch this and, and think they're mainstream, but the writings are, uh, I mean, I, I've been a lifelong member, and I've never heard a lot of that stuff, and I think there are a lot of people that say, whoa, that's fringe. I also think Latter-day Saints are very uh, uncomfortable with the word cult because sometimes we're, we're saying we're in a cult. You said earlier, Melanie, that you're not in a cult, but, but we're, uh, are you in a fringe group? Are you in a group that's not mainstream? We're Lori and Chad in a group that's not mainstream. Hang on one second. Can you hear me okay, Nate? Yeah, I got you. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not any cult, and I don't believe any radical beliefs off of the, you know, I believe it. Can you still see us? You're there, no. Yeah, I got you. Okay. Um, I don't believe in anything that is against the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There are, you know, topics where, you know, we don't have full understanding, like you see in this document, um, it talks translation we don't have information a lot of that in our church um, it's something that's talked about in the scriptures and these are things that you know are interesting and you want to learn and know more about them these are the mysteries of god that you, you know no one really has the real answers on and uh, these are things to learn about but there's no beliefs that i have or that i know that chad and lori have that are against the church of jesus christ of our saints or anything inconsistent with with that faith um one other question about the document, Ian, and then we can we can move on. You mentioned sure. in there that that you know your intent was not to you didn't want to smear any money. Your intent was to protect your family and help solve the case of the missing kids. So, can you guys address the public as to what you all are doing to help in the case? So, we uh, you know to the best of our knowledge, have cooperated fully with with the FBI with law enforcement. Anytime they've had questions, we've answered. Um, and you know, that's all we can do right now. We're trying to put, you know, some, I guess, trying to set people at ease a little bit. You know, right now the kids are missing. We don't know where they are. And there's so much speculation because of this information that's leaked. Um, you know, and, and the accusations that Charles made in his, in his divorce paperwork and people coming out of the woodwork to come after Chad, you know, there's a lot of speculation on what's happening, but so far, all we know is that they're missing. And I think, uh, you know, Janice put it, or sorry, uh, Lori's mom, Janice, she put it really well. The kids aren't, you know, the kids aren't missing to Lori. They're missing to the rest of us. And we don't know where. And while I would absolutely love to know where they are, just get this over with, move on with my life. Um, I have to, I have to try to have faith and believe that there's going to be a happy ending. To this. I certainly hope there is because it's going to have a really negative effect on my life and on Melody's life if there isn't. So you guys have talked with the police in Rexburg and, and the FBI and you yeah. and they want to talk to you, you're open to talking with them and answering questions. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I ate with detective Aramisio and then, um, I invited FBI into my home for a few hours and told them everything that I didn't know. I, and I didn't know, um, Ian had been, did I know you were working with them at that point? No, that my first, um, meeting with FBI, I shared a lot of these things I'm sharing with you, Nate, and they were like, Okay, this isn't where we thought this would be. We, we, we had heard all these things from Ian and from Natalie and from Brandon and, you know, from Kay, and it doesn't, you know, we haven't heard this other side of, you know, reason why why would Lori be doing what she's doing? Why does she not feel safe to uh, say where her kids are? Or why does she feel she, the need to protect them? Um, I've heard, I've heard, I don't know if I've heard you guys, but a lot of people have said this is a lot of hype. Granted, the media has, you know, latched onto this story because it is two missing kids. So the hype could die down if the kids were produced or if they, you know, if she said where the kid are. Why do you think she won't? I don't have that answer, but I know no one is listening to her side. She's been what seems proven guilty before even given the chance to speak for herself. And I know she hasn't come forward and said that, and I, but she knows what she's doing. I believe, and she knows where the kids are, 
And I think, I, I can't remember the quote she said uh, very initially when um, things kind of took off, something about when all this speculation and rumor is over. Uh, I believe when all the speculation and rumor is over and we're, um, we're looking at the real facts here, I believe, you know, she has, I, I know she doesn't have reason to trust, trust a lot of people right now. And, you know, I can't ask that question to her and she's, you know, in jail waiting her time to um, have her time to defend and, and tell her story. And why just can't, why that. Can't, Melanie, why can't you ask her where the kids are? She's in jail and everything's been recorded. And as we uh, heard earlier in her court case, it sounds like her uh, recorded and then given to uh, Lieutenant Baller, the prosecutor over there. And uh, I don't feel like that's a, um, I, I feel like that's a huge concern. I don't think if I asked her, she would tell me. I mean, she didn't tell me before, um, probably just to not involve me and in whatever she's got going on. Um, and I, I just trusted, you know, she's, she's got a plan and um, I just want to be love and support and do whatever I can. But when it comes down to it, every fear, every worry, every doubt that I have, it doesn't stick to the knowledge I do know of who Lori is and everything she's done to protect those kids. Those kids love their mom and you know, they don't want to be with Kay. Uh, JJ's never wanted to be with Kay. And uh, I mean, I wish we could see the times Kate's actually come to try to be in JJ's life. And, uh, I mean, I was there in Arizona most of the time Lori and JJ were there after they adopted him. And I don't, I might have met Kate one time, but uh, she wasn't a big part of JJ's life. And I just, I see her even just for aggression. And um, it's, it's not somebody who, um, it, you just, I see a lot of things behind the scenes that aren't being said. Um, and I don't know everything going on. I don't know where Lori would have the kids. But, Do you think they're uh, safe? I, I know Chad has said that they are safe. And of course, that's, we don't know what that means, but do you do you think they're safe? Do you think they're in a bunker somewhere or? Nate, let me, let me modify this just a little bit. Part of the premise of what our clients are saying, and, and of course includes Melanie and her sitting here with us, but also Summer and Janice. The premise of it is, is first and foremost, they don't think they've ever seen anything in Lori's life that would give them any evidence that she could harm her children. And so that, that's base one. The next level is that they know that Lori had a basis um, on the belief that she needed to do take steps to protect her kids. Um, we don't have all the details about that, but she had expressed at least that much to them. They were moving out of the state of Arizona. They were going away. She had a reason for doing that. The, the third thing on this is that um, they had um, experienced in Lori's life this notion that she has a substantial distrust of the system because of its failure in her ability to protect her own kids. The system never was able to help her do that, the judicial system. I'm speaking. And so it, it's hard to go into Lori and say, well, just tell us where the kids are, but it undermines everything that I just set forward. They don't think she did anything to the kids. They know she's got a basis for wanting to protect them. She knows, they know that she doesn't um, uh, trust the system. And so yeah. to go in and ask her if she were to tell them where the kids are would undermine her ultimate purpose, which is to protect the kids. I, I don't think the question, I mean, everybody wants that question asked because they just want to see where the kids are. But that's not what Lori's goal is here. I think Lori's goal is is to protect them, and, and and saying where they are doesn't protect them in her mind. I think I, the bigger question we see where are the kids? Where are the kids? I think the bigger question is why does Lori feel the need to protect her kids, and from who, from what? And until we know that question, she probably will not tell any of us that. And you know, she's willing to sit in jail over keeping quiet and not sharing that information. Yeah. I saw a, a news clip from Kay where she said that she's never threatened Lori. And then at the end of the conversation, she said, yeah, I, I said, had some phone calls and emails where I said some pretty mean things, but, but really I just want to see the kids and, or, or see JJ. And you, know, you, you can't have it both ways. You, you sent mean and, and, and nasty communications that, that caused Lori to be threatened or you didn't. And it sounds like she did. And Lori's saying she did. So, you know, we expect Kate's going to come forward and say more. You know, I, I would never want to harm um, JJ. All I wanted to do was this. But in Lori's mind and in Lori's perspective, 
uh, she was under attack and she felt that she had good reason to believe that and took the and has taken whatever steps she took in order to, to uh, fulfill that goal. Melanie, when's the last time you spoke with her? Um, I had a phone call with her in, I want to say the second week of December. It was, or it was after, um, and that was right, right when I had just found out. It was, the, I think it was the night Ian told me uh, that he had been going to the police and FBI. Um, and I, I hadn't heard anything from them from then on out. So from December, mid-December probably. And then she and Chad went moved to Hawaii, or they were already in Hawaii at that time. I'm, I would guess that they were already in the last week in November, and then, um, you know, a couple weeks later, I, uh, you know, had, had a phone call with them. I didn't have their, their number, and uh, I think it was, it was the last time. Um, but yeah, that I spoke with them. Well, what do you want people to know about what you guys know about any involvement about your aunt, about the kids? What would be your final closing statement? Kids. Our, our biggest focus is we're working on our own custody cases right now that are affected by all this speculation and rumor. Um, it's deflecting from what our kids are doing um, and keeping our kids away from us unjustly. Um, and that's our that's our biggest focus. I think we're we're running on faith and hope that you know Lori's Lori's got a plan and she knows where JJ and Tylee are. But I don't know where my children are, and um, I'm having all these having to spend all this time coming up and um, you know telling the truth because uh, everything's been manipulated and into lies in the media. People aren't seeing the whole picture of things, and this is a whole deflection on. Um, you know, the, the truth, everything that's being thrown around, all these ideas and people bouncing off each other and um, they're missing the main, the, the truth here. And that's, I think they're, that's our ex's goal. Let's distract from everything they're doing and confuse it in this case um, and take advantage of it, which is it's sad. It's sad for our children. Pray for them every day and we know we're going to be with them soon. And, you know, maybe they'll, maybe they'll see us on TV, maybe not, but we, we know that they know who we are. And we just we patiently await every day until we're reunited with them. Ian, is there anything you want to add? This is kind of basically echo what Melanie said. You know, we we've got her ex-husband and my ex-wife who are you know now taking advantage of this case and going ham with it to keep our children away from us. Um, when you know they're they're making all sorts of claims and when they know Melanie, she was she, she was the primary caretaker of her four kids for 10 years, never did anything at all to harm them, um, was a loving mother. And for some reason, all of a sudden, you know, now Brandon's trying to take them away. You know, and same thing with my ex-wife. I, I took good care of my kids and, and I loved them. They loved being with me. They loved being with Melody. You know, we had them through, you know, all, almost entirely through the month of January. I think there was one week when we didn't have the kids almost, you know, sole custody essentially, even though, our, our, our custody agreement was, you know, Natalie essentially had primary custody. She just kind of gave them to me and said, I can't handle this right now. Um, didn't have any problems with Melanie or me being around the kids at that point, but now that's a problem. Um, so that, you know, it's, this whole case, it's, it's being used against us to keep our children away. Our exes are frustrated with, you know, things kind of blew up when she and I got married. They, they both kind of became very upset. It's just, it's, it's strange to have this case continue. You know, that we have, we had a preliminary hearing scheduled for, I think, the 7th and the 8th, and now it's been pushed out to join them. Until things get resolved, it's going to continue to affect us. We're just ready for it to be done. It's been a huge stall, Nate, and, you know, with, you know, unfortunately, COVID's been pushing things back, but the most disappointing thing was when we had a family custody hearing, finally, for this the Boudreaux case when our children, Brandon didn't show up. I don't know where he was, and later on, seeing him on TV, a few days later, front row at Lori's hearing, waiting to you know, see if they can keep her in jail longer and um, not reduce her bail. That's upsetting. Why, where were my kids during then? And why, why is he leaving them? Um, and why, why are they not the focus here of, of his life? Um, and it's sad to see that. And tomorrow's Mother's Day. And I just, I have every plea in my heart that will have any kindness in his heart to reunite me with with my children and let them talk to their mother. They're scared. 
they don't, I don't know what they've been told, but I know they know in their hearts who I am. I've, I've done everything for them and my whole life put everything, every ounce into them. And I'm so grateful I've done day without them. It's just, it's, it's unbearable. Um, and I know everything's going to come forward eventually. And as we keep trying to tell the truth and be ourselves and try to do the right thing, I know things are going to work out. I just want to thank you for being open-minded to share both sides and not being afraid to share truth. I know there's so much confusion out there and this is, this is what we want. We just want everything to be heard. And I think everything will eventually unravel as we, we see it continuing to move forward. Um, you asked if anything, I appreciate you being willing to clarify anything that um, has been reported wrong because we see it reported wrong every day in all these different news sources. And I desperately just want to call each one and help and say, hey, you got this wrong. I short, these are the facts. And um, I remember uh, you saying, uh, you know, how Brendan Drew has claimed that I have a million dollars of reasons to shoot at him, kill him, or money for a cult. And I know you're just reporting what you hear and, uh, you know, what's given to you. And I appreciate you giving us the time to respond to these, these false um, accusations. And um, we're always happy to answer and clear up questions and uh, just...